Okay, so um, fortunately, this is uh, when things start to get interesting, but uh, well, we'll try to cover some more advanced material now. So first of all, before um, um, getting to uh, sophisticated material, let's convince ourselves that this set of uh, vertex operator algebra we get is interesting by enumerating some examples. So I told you that uh, the boring examples of free field theories, um, where we get uh, some uh, symplectic bosons obeying uh, this kind of OP, where Q in some representation, representation R of some group G. Uh, those, those would be the, the half hypers, and then uh, and then we are going to have a BCC ghost system um, uh, where now these are adjoint indices of the group. They correspond to the vector. Uh, and so you may uh, think then, then to find the vertex operator algebra that corresponds to a Lagrangian n equal to 2 theory with a group, gauge group G and R matter, I mean half upper multiple representation R, you just need to take the tensor product of these two uh, free vertex operator algebra and construct composite operator which are singlets under the action of G. That's, of course, a reasonable first guess, uh, but, um, but upon further thinking, it's clear that cannot be the right answer. Okay, so simply taking the, simply restricting to gauge singlets um, will generate some uh, VOA, let me call it zero, um, that clearly corresponds to uh, the VOA which is obtained just from starting from the free Lagrangian. If I switch off the gauge coupling, remember, there is a gauge coupling tau, and I've switched off the gauge coupling. I literally will just find the tensor product of the free hypermultiplet and the free vector multiplets, and all that I have to do is to impose the Gauss law constraint, which amounts to restricting to gauge singlets. So this is the correct answer in the free limit, but as I emphasized multiple uh, times, the free limit corresponds to one of these singular cusps, and it's boring because we have this just tensor product of free theories, we want to do something more interesting. And so we really want to describe the vertex operator algebra in the middle of this conformal manifold. And there are um, a first set of good news is that the, um, uh, all you need to do is to consider the infinitesimal one loop correction to this result. And what that is going to do is to lift off a bunch of these of the operators that you have in this free approximation to the vertex operator algebra by the mechanism that I quickly reviewed yesterday. Several of these sure operators multiplet will combine together to form a long multiplet, which is then able to acquire an anomalous dimension as a move away from this free field point, and then away from the free, from the street zero coupling point. Uh, I should should, simply should forget about those uh, operators because they're not protected. And so the moment I move away an infinitesimal distance away, I will, so as I turn on the coupling, for coupling non-zero, there will be a smaller VOA, strictly smaller VOA, which is the one that I really truly want to identify with my interacting uh, theory in the middle of the conformal manifold. 
And one can argue that this is sufficient to look at the infinitesimal uh, truncation of the operators. And moreover, the other good news is that um, then any, continuum, uh, any continuous deformation inside the conformal manifold, which is epsilon away from these cusps, uh, the vertex operator algebra is invariant under any such continuous deformation. In other terms, the state of space as well as all the OPE coefficients are independent of exactly marginal couplings. The moment you are careful to uh, you know, con take into account this, uh, this continuous jump that happens at each of the cusps. Okay? Um, so, so in that sense, the vertex operator algebra associated with the 4D theory captures, in, if I have a Lagrangian theory with a marginal coupling, this captures protective information, protect, pro information which is truly invariant under any deformations of the, uh, of the theory, including uh, marginal couplings. And there is a very elegant, concise prescription to find this restriction of the naive uh, VOA associated to the free field theory to the one interacting theory, which consists in the following. Well, first of all, we are going to take the, uh, let's, let's first take this naive tensor product uh, of, of, of VOAs, and uh, the correct VOA will be obtained by, uh, well, let me put it this way. Um, we are going to compute a cohomology Cohomological prescription um, where, um, um, where there will be some differential, which I'm going to call QBRST. I hope the story is clear. Now I'm purely in the two dimensional world, so I, I'm, not, I'm not talking anymore about the square Q that I had earlier, which is a four dimensional object. Now I'm purely in the uh, in the two-dimensional world, and I assert that it's possible to uh, take into account this, this continuous jump that happens away from the cusp by imposing that the states that remain are a subset of this naive tensor product, which is this, the cohomology classes of this operator. VC, uh, VC Ghost system uh, A. So let me explain a notation. Well, first of all, CA is clear. It's um, the, uh, uh, the ghost that corresponds to the four dimensional gauge you know, in with a joint index A. And then by, by assumption, we know that the matter field transform in some representation R of, um, of the group that I'm gauging. And so I told you earlier that very generally, any time that you have a continuous global symmetry, that induces that, this, that, that statement descends to the fact that there is a affine, this is an affine cut smoothing current, which is purely made of Q and Q tilde, and in fact, given that Q and Q tilde have um, uh, dimension one half, you can instantly write it schematically. This would take the form Q, Q tilde, again, with the, with the matrix of, uh, the of G in the representation R. And this is just the ghost. Uh, current, which is made of, uh, of BC, you can, you can also write it down, uh, the, it corresponds to the, again, to the same continuous transformation G, but now acting in the adjoint representation on the BC goals themselves. And um, it turns out that this object is nilpotent precisely when the level of the matter current equals to minus two 
the dual Coxeter number of G. And if you translate in two-dimensional notation what I told you in the first lecture, this is precisely the condition for the vanishing of the four-dimensional beta function. So if this gauging procedure is allowed in four-dimensional, meaning that it, it preserves conformality, then I can find an important BRST operator purely written in terms of these two-dimensional data. And I'm claiming that passing to the commodity to this BRST operator removes all the sure operators that recombine into long operators and leaves me with the truly protected operator in the middle of the conformal manifold. Okay, so uh, you will understand that then this gives a prescription, a very concrete prescription, to calculate the VOA in all Lagrangian examples. And in fact, it's more general than that. If you have one of these mysterious uh, building block matter, generalized matter theory that I talked about in the first lecture, and you know the VOA that corresponds to, to it, let me assume that I know it, and then I do a gauging procedure such that I gauge some uh, subgroup of the global symmetry in such a way that this condition is obeyed. You see this condition, uh, well, I, I, this condition is phrased in a purely universal fashion that does not depend on having a Lagrangian description, then the exact same procedure will work where now I will replace the free VOA for the symplectic bosons with this strongly coupled building block, which is the VOA of the generalized matter superconformal field theory. Okay, so this gives a uh, powerful way to construct VOAs in many examples. Although, admittedly, computing this uh, cohomology can be a little complicated, and so um, what we often do, we come up with a, we do a level-by-level level calculation uh, starting from h equals small and then going up, we convince ourselves that we have a plausible guess for the VOA and then we subject it to a variety of checks and then um, formulate a conjecture and then mathematicians uh, prove it. That's a typical workflow in this kind of examples. Okay, so let me now give you a few uh, let me give you the, a couple of simple Lagrangian examples. And then I will make a list of VOAs for several more non-Lagrangian examples where this kind of approach is not available. We cannot, uh, this is in some sense, it's, it's a perfectly constructive approach. We know the free theory. We compute this very thick homology. It may be hard to compute it, but it's clear that there is an answer. Uh, that often you can guess. In the non-Lagrangian case is, is more of a, again, a guesswork based on, um, on plausible assumptions. It's often the case that you know some data of these mysterious non-Lagrangian, you, you know central charges, you know the global symmetry, you know a little bit of information about the Higgs branch, and put this information together, it's often the case that there's one compelling guess for the associative UA, which you can then set subject to a variety of checks. Okay, so, so let's do the simplest example in, in the Lagrangian world, which is this, we take uh, G equal SU2 and NF equal to four. As I indicated yesterday, the, what you really should do is to think in terms of half hypermultiplets, which are in the um, SO8. So the, the naive um, flavored symmetry would be U4, but it truly really enhances to SO8. And then the index A is the, S, this is the flavor, and this is the, um, this is the gauge group. Uh, and this is the four-dimensional field, but without further ado, we have learned that that descends to a, to a um, symplectic boson, and so the matter part of the theory gives me symplectic bosons that obey this um, OP. And then, um, and then I have B and C ghosts in the adjoint of SU2. Okay, so no, 
So you can do this exercise now. You can compute this cohomology. This exercise is actually not so easy. Uh, and what you discover is a rather elegant result. The result in VOA, the VOA of this SU2 super QCD, is nothing but the SO8 uh, current algebra at level minus 2. I mean, of course, the level you could have computed instantly by using this formula. We know the level of the four-dimensional uh, flavor current, so we can just compute the level. And it's um, all the, the other statement that I want to make, so you re remember that the flavor currents are in the B hat 1 multiplet. And we also know uh, very well, because the Lagrangian theory, we can, we can study this in, without any problem. We also have detailed knowledge of the Higgs branch. In fact, I, I, I uh, left that as an exercise yesterday. Did anybody do it? No, it's OK. Uh, I will tell you the answer later. Um, and I explained yesterday how um, one can describe, very, on very general grounds, one can describe the Higgs branch of a four-dimensional superconformal field theory as a hyperkähler cone. It has to be a cone because there's an action of the dilation symmetry. And for our purposes, I also explained that the, the best uh, description is useful for us is to think of it as a symplectic, as a holomorphic. I explained this in a discussion section, perhaps not all of you were there. It's a holomorphic, symplectic uh, variety, which is a cone, a holomorphic symplectic cone. Uh, and then we can look at the, uh, so this is Ham Higgs. We can look at the algebra holomorphic function on the Higgs branch, and we identify this with the, uh, with the Higgs chiral ring, which is generated by the Schur operator with e equal to 2R, so which is the, which is the ring of Schur operator with e equal to 2R. And I also explained that we can describe uh, this ring in terms of a finite set of generator obeying some relations. So the generators of the Higgs branch are then in the language, in the four-dimensional language, are then the highest weight of this B hat, uh, B hat R multiplets, such that by taking products of them, I generate the entire set of operators that obey this condition. Is this clear? So we have detailed knowledge, not just in this simple example, in many example of the Higgs branch as a, uh, as a variety. So we know the generator, we know the relations, we know the symplectic structure. In Lagrangian example like this one, we can compute them by the hyperkähler quotient. And in non-Lagrangian examples, knowledge of this, day of this Higgs branch data comes from more in direct consideration, maybe you can embed them in string theory. Maybe you can get them by various dualities. So we have, anyway, the Higgs branch data are, is very robust data, so it's something that we can often get either very directly by doing the hyperkähler quotient or indirectly by some other considerations. And the structural fact that I want to emphasize is the following little theorem that you can prove using the construction I've given you so far. That generators of the Higgs branch First of all, they are sure operators, so they must uh, appear in the chiral algebra, but they are necessarily generators of the chiral algebra. Okay, so let me emphasize this little fact, which is important. The generators of the Higgs branch chiral ring, which is also the same thing as uh, holomorphic function of the Higgs branch, our, under our map kind, be become what are called in the mathematical literature strong generators of 
of the VOA. And let, you, have, you have always known all your life what this generator is, but let me explain it to you. You know, all knowledge is reminiscence, as Plato said. So what is a generator? Is the thing, if you, a VOA is uniquely character, it finds a generated VOA, which is the very large, which is pretty much any VOA you've ever seen in your life, is characterized by listing a finite set of operators such that if you take normal order product of holomorphic derivative of them, you generate the entire set of operators. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's, it's a triviality. Examples, Virasoro has a single generator known as T of Z. All operators of the theory are obviously obtained by taking arbitrarily many products of T sprinkled with holomorphic derivative. Clearly enough. For affine cuts moody is the, the generators are just the current, and then it's the same story. You're now going to take arbitrarily many products of holomorphic derivative of the currents, and that is the entire state space of the VOA. You may be familiar with W algebras. For example, the vanilla type of um, the vanilla type of WN algebras, we have generators T, which we also can call W2, W3 all the way up to WN, which we have holomorphic dimensions 2, 3, up to N. And those taking normal order products of holomorphic derivative of this, you get the full state space, et cetera. Okay, so generators of the Higgs branch color ring become generators of the VOA. And of course, we know that uh, at the very least, okay, so perhaps I want to keep the suspense a little more, but okay, let me, let me not give, uh, I don't have time for this kind of, this kind of, um, of theatrics, so let me just give you the answer for what the Higgs branch of this theory is. The Higgs branch of, um, of SU2 um, uh, super QCD, um, okay, so let me write and then I'll explain it, is the same thing as the closure of the minimal impotent orbit for SO8. And um, okay, so that explaining the notation will, will take me a little too much time, but let me explain this in a, a concrete way. So this means that I take uh, some formal generators X, uh, let's call them XM, where M is an adjoint index of SO8. And I take the symmetric algebra of, of this complexified Lie algebra of SO8, and I impose a single quadratic, a set of quadratic relations. So this object is in the adjoint of SO8. What are these objects? These are nothing but the moment maps. These are the dimension two. This, this is, these are the things that, can, that correspond to the objects with E equal to two and R equal to one. Right, the object I have indicated earlier is mu. These are the objects which are the highest weights of, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, equal, to, uh, the highest weight of SU2, which I'm from in the adjoint of the flavored symmetry SO8. Those are the ones that correspond, those are, gen, those are elements of the Higgs branch, and the claims that they generate the, Higgs, the full Higgs branch, but there is a relation that happens at the quadratic order and the relations, so if I take a product of two such objects, given that clearly commute, they're bosonic objects, I'm going to find, I have to take the, the symmetric product of the adjoint of SO8 
and symmetrize. And the adjoint of n to a is the 28. So, sorry, is it the 28? Sorry, it's the 8 times 7 divided by 2 is 28. Okay, yes, we're good. So I, I need to symmetrize 28 times 28, and you can check that that gives you the singlet plus the 35 vector plus the 35 um, spinner plus the 35 uh, conjugate spinner plus 300. That's just a fact. And so uh, the quadratic, so let me call this whole uh, set of operator, let me call it I2. With this definition, then I'm going to impose that X tensor X restricted to I2 vanishes. Okay, so this may not appear immediately intuitive if you haven't seen it before, but it's a standard construction, okay? It's a standard construction because it's extremely general. It generalizes to, um, to any uh, Lie algebra. And for any Lie algebra, you do the same thing. You take the adjoint of G, any simple Lie algebra, the adjoint of G symmetrize, and you define this I2 uh, ideal as the thing such that I2 plus uh, the red sum of uh, the representation whose, uh, whose dinking uh, labels are twice the one of the adjoint gives me the symmetrized product of the adjoint. Okay? You can do this very generally. And for SOA, that's how it looks. Let's do another example. Let's take G to be SU2. Well, then the adjoint of SU2 is 3. What is 3 times 3? Symmetrized. 3 times 3 is 9. And you will recall that 9 is equal to 1 plus 3 plus 5. Right? The triple come is the anti-symmetrization. And the... Well, I hope I'm not saying anything. This is really elementary now. So the symmetric product of two triplets gives me the one plus the five. The five is the object whose dinky labels are twice the dinky label of the adjoint. Clear enough. The dinky label of the adjoint is one. The five is the dinky label two. And so in this case, uh, in this case, this is what I would call I2. Okay? And so this I2 can clearly define for any Lie algebra, and it's called the Joseph ideal. And if I take the symmetric algebra of the Lie algebra G and I impose that the I2 vanishes, I find the variety, which is um, the minimal nilpotent orbit of the algebra, and has a very uh, simple physical interpretation. This is the moduli space of instantons of charge one for that symmetry group. Okay, the moduli space of SO8 instantons with charge one is described by this variety. Okay. And so this is something you, in, in the case of super QCD, this is something that you can really check by hand by doing the hyperkähler quotient. If you start with the description in terms of the Qs and you do the hyperkähler quotient, you will find that this is the answer for the variety. Okay, so uh, where does this lead me? Well, I asserted, and it, you can, it's easy provable, that generator of the Higgs branch chiral ring are generator of the vertex operator algebra. And so I know for a fact that the vertex operator algebra, at the very least, must contain these SO8 affine currents. And the non-trivial uh, part of the statement I was making earlier 
So I said earlier, so I know, I know, I certainly know that the full vertex operator algebra SU2 super QCD must at least contain SO8, and I can easily compute the level is minus two. And the non-trivial part of the statement is that it doesn't contain anything else. Okay, so that comes from a complicated cohomological calculation. But if you didn't know, if all you knew is that this symmetry has favored symmetry SO8, at level minus two, you say, well, what is the minimalistic guess I can make is this one. A minimalistic guess in this business often turn out to be correct. Okay, questions about this? Now, there is, sorry. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So the fact that that um, vertical spiritual object saturates the central charge that you want is not enough to, to conclude that there is nothing else? Okay, great. You're anticipating what I was about to say. So, um, um, you may have objected that uh, for sure I know that there has to be at least an additional generator or an additional operator T. I remember, I, I had this whole story earlier. I explained that very generally we always have a T that descends from the art symmetry current of the uh, of the four-dimensional theory. And um, so there must be a T, but in this particular K, D, I, can, I, I simply identify uh, T with the Sugavara stress tensor of the affine current algebra. The reason for it, and this is a non-trivial calculation you can do, you can compute the, two the 2D central charge using the formula I gave you earlier, The 2D central charge is uniquely fits in terms of a C anomaly. And it also happens to be the case that this value is numerically equal to the Sugavara dimension, the Sugavara uh, central charge is the dimension of G times uh, K divided by K plus a check for, for an affine current symmetry a level k, and it, it agrees. So we know that in this case, we could try to get away without introducing a separate uh, stress tensor, uh, but it's still not a compelling argument, or, or at least not a complete argument, because if my VOA had been unitary, this would have been a good argument. You check saturation at Sugavara central charge, and then you know that you're done. You cannot add additional stuff. But my mu is not unitary, so w how do I know? Perhaps I could add an additional, uh, some additional stuff that contribute to some sustensor, additional operator, which is orthogonal to this one. The story is a little bit more involved. But the conclusion is correct, and that's what I'm going to explain next. One needs a more elaborate unitarity argument based on four-dimensional unitarity that will indeed lead to the conclusion that if the two-dimensional, uh, uh, in the case you have an affine current algebra, if the central charge computed this way agrees with the Sugavara central charge, then you know for a fact that the uh, stress tensor is a Sugavara stress tensor. Okay, so, um, Yes. Sorry? They appear, everything appears pretty much. Any kind of uh, reasonable uh, symplectic variety, a symplectic cone can be obtained in this huge zoo of theories. Okay, so. Um, Well, okay, before I do that, let me, let me uh, generalize the story to a nice, nice little sequence of four-dimensional theories. Uh, so these are names, let me also put H0. These are names uh, that are associated to uh, Kodaira singularities, 
not all of them, but some of them have these names. And um, if I consider an F-theory singularity, which you can think of some D7 non-perturbative D7 brain setup in type 2B, and I probe and I probe it with one D3 brain, the field theory that lives on D3 brain reduces the low energy to a superconformal field theory. So this is a simple, nice sequence of superconformal field theories that have um, one-dimensional Coulomb branch because you have a single D3 brain. Okay, so this is... Um, you know, appealing to the knowledge of those of you who know a little bit of these things. If you don't, I'm just take, take my statements. The fact that the D3 brain is inside the D7 brain immediately tells me the Higgs branch. Right? So remember, the D3 brain can be understood as an instanton inside the D7 brain. And so the um, instanton moduli space of, so H0 is no flavored symmetry. H1 corresponds to flavored symmetry SU2. This is SU3, and these are the obvious things. E6, E7, E8. I find superconformal field theories. Let me just name the superconformal field theories by the names of the associated Kodaira singularity. These are rank one superconformal field theory, rank one because the Coulomb branch is dimension one, with this amount of flavored symmetry. And the Higgs, their Higgs branch is the one instant of moduli space of GF. Okay, the case that I just studied, the Lagrangian case, is this one. In this case, you don't need F theory. This is a perturbative, something you can see in perturbative string theory. And so this is a case that has a weak coupling limit, and it's the example of super QCD SU2 with four flavors. The other examples are non-perturbative. So with the exception of this theory that has no Higgs branch, the others have the Higgs branch is the one in modular space of the corresponding flavored symmetry groups. So that is a very nice, simple generalization of the story here. What is the VOA? Well, it turns out that this one is the Virasoro algebra at level minus 20, at central charge minus 22 over 5. This is SU2 at level minus 4 thirds. This is SU3 at level minus 3 half. This is the one that we just did. This is SO8 at level minus 2. This is E6 at a, a level minus 3. E7 at level minus 4. And E8 at level. Well, because you know it, but I wanted somebody to say minus five. <laughs> okay, so, um, so how do we know this? Well, first of all, minimalistic guess. Again, we know that this must be subalgebras by the argument that I gave. We know the level, so at the very least, this is contained in the VOA, and the fact that it's exactly the VOA requires further uh, arguing. So, um, so now I'm trying to give further uh, arguments for it by uh, thinking a little bit uh, in terms of the constraints of four-dimensional unitarity. Okay, but before I, go, I do that, let me, ask, let me make the following statement. You know, what is this whole business uh, good for? Well, at the very least, you should be mildly impressed by the fact that if you believe this correspondence, I now get to compute a huge amount of correlation functions in, in you know, OPE coefficients, dimensions, et cetera, for some strongly coupled theories that a priori you would not have had easy access to. Because everything, in, everything downstairs, these are just a fine Kazuti algebra at some funny level, everything downstairs is, is perfectly computable, and so I can lift, lift up that information and learn about this nice, um, 
BPS setter of the four dimensional theory. And this is something that is actually really useful because, for example, for this E6 theory, um, we use this information as input to fix a large set of data in the OP of four external operators, those we fix using the scalar algebra, and the unfixed stuff, which is, corresponds to long multiplets, we fed into this numerical booster machinery that I described in my colloquium. And then using the, that numerical booster machinery, we fixed, or uh, more precisely put bounds, but we believe that they're saturated on the non-protected stuff. But this program couldn't really have got off the ground if we had not known this huge amount of protected information because that was the only way to tell the bootstrap that we are speaking about this particular theory with this six symmetry. Okay, so there's practical implications, but that, let's look at now at more structural properties. And um, let me um, go back to this grading that I had earlier. So a priori there's a third quantum number, little r, but I'm going to forget it because in all of this example, all the operators have little r equal to zero, so it's not important. And remember, we also had this uh, relation that little h was r plus l, from which, of course, we conclude that uh, r is uh, smaller or equal than little h. Or operators where r is equal to h, these are operators that in 4D, these are Higgs branch chiral operators. So the, sub, so the subspace V11 is the space spanned by the affine currents. GA. Okay? But if I want to think in terms of states, I put a vacuum here. H is equal to 1. And I also know for a fact that this descended from the B hat 1 multiplet that had R equal to 1. Okay, so the, in this simple case, there is a clear assignment of little r. Is this clear? A priori little r could have been zero or one half, but I'm asserting that that's an impossibility because there's no four dimensional multiplet with those charge assignments. So we know for a fact, also more concretely, we know exactly where the affine current came from. It came from the four dimensional moment map. So I have an unambiguous assignment of this r quantum number. But now let me look at j minus 1a, j minus 1b, and things here are more tricky. What is the, well, first of all, it's clear enough that the h assignment is 2. I just count 1 plus 1. But what is the r assignment? Well, the r assignment a priori can be 2 or it can be 1. Yes? I don't know the other assignment a priori. And um, it cannot be 0 because this is not a thing that exists. But now I'm going to play a nice little game. And first of all, consider the uh, first, let's first consider a case in which we project uh, these objects to some non singlet representation. Is, is, is not the uh, singlet. So, what is V2? What is V21? V21 is an operator with R charge 1 and dimension 2. But let me claim that the only possible state with these quantum numbers 
is the stress tensor. The only multiplet in four dimension, if I assume that I have a unique stress tensor and there are no higher spin conserve current, blah, 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 with, with that will lead to this charge assignment is the four dimensional art symmetry current. Okay? But, well, the stress tensor is clearly a singlet. So in the non singlet sector, I know for a fact that this is V22. Okay, why is that powerful? Because I gave you earlier a little rule for, for computation of the norms. So if I know R, I know H, and in this case, actually, it's very easy to decide what sigma should be. Sigma contains a minus sign. That is the minus sign we saw earlier in the flip of the level. I now have a inequality to satisfy that I can impose on this gadget. And the inequality is actually non-trivial. I can compute the inner product of these j's just using the commutation relations in the affine cuts moody current. And I find that this inequality leads to a bound on k. K has to be smaller or equal than some uh, number that depends on G. On the flavored symmetry G. When this inequality is violated, I find a contradiction with four-dimensional unitarity. And, well, happily enough, the bounds are precisely saturated by this sequence of algebras. So the bound for SO8 tends that K has to be smaller or equal than minus two. But how do we interpret saturation of the bound? The only way that I can have saturation of the bound is if the state is null. And so this actually means, and you can check, that SO8 at level minus two, if you go ahead and compute the restriction of this gadget onto the um, 35V representation, this is null. And what does this mean? It means that the upstairs theory, the four-dimensional theory, must have a relation among the Higgs brand generators, which was one of the relations that defined the SO8 minimal impotent orbit. And that, of course, everything hangs together. It's only at this particular level that I can hope to reproduce the four dimensional Higgs branch, because it's only at that particular level that the multiplication of my uh, affine uh, currents has an alt state, and then alt state signals the presence of a Higgs branch relation. So there's a very nice interplay between the four-dimensional geometry and representation theory of these, uh, of these vertex operator algebra negative levels. And you will recall that, um, um, that the, um, well, okay, so that's half of the story to get the correct Higgs branch. And the other half of this, sorry, um, this sets to zero really all, the, all these gadgets, 35V, 35S, and 35C. To get the correct result, now I need to argue that the singlet, uh, all, there's also a relation in the singlet in the Higgs branch. And that requires a little bit of further argument because uh, if I now project this representation on the singlets, of course, that's precisely the case where I can have a contamination of the stress tensor. So what we can conclude on general grounds is um, so now let's do the non-singlet case. 
the single case, sorry. So if I take now this to be the singlet, in fact, let me precisely map it using the killing form. This is what is sometimes called S. It's the unnormalized Sugawara stress tensor. Well, now it's, it's trickier. So a priori, this could be an object which I'm going to call mu squared which lives in V2, 1, sorry, V2, 2, plus alpha times T, which lives in V2, 1, okay? So T is the map of the arc symmetry current. Remember that story? And mu squared is what comes in the image of the product of mu, of the operator that I called mu before in four dimensions. Okay, this is a Higgs branch operator. It has, is in B hat two, and it has R equal to two, and this is something else. So a priori, I have these two components, but now it's a trivial exercise again, using the fact that I know all these commutation relations in the VOA to actually compute alpha. Alpha turns out to be something like DG, let me actually copy it to be precise. Um, turns out to be K divided times CG divided by C. And so actually here you truly have an overlap. You see, that's where this business of assigning this R grading becomes interesting. You may have thought that naively, given this is the product of two things with R equal to one, it has R equal to two, but not, not really. It has a piece with R equal to two and a piece with R equal to one, but I know exactly how they come about. And now, with this sophisticated, more sophisticated knowledge, I can go ahead and impose positivity of the norms. And I'm going to discover that positivity of the norm imposes an inequality on the, uh, sorry, it's the other way around, inequality on the two-dimensional central charge, let's say a two-dimensional central charge is greater or equal than the Sugawara central charge as a consequence of four-dimensional unitarity. And when it is saturated, it means that I have a null state, and what it is null state is mu squared. When this inequality is saturated, the two-two component that corresponds to the square of the moment map in the single representation is set to zero, but that is, of course, precisely the missing relation, the missing quadratic relation that sets to zero the product of the SOA moment maps in the single representation. And so, lo and behold, precisely when these bounds are saturated, we can conclude that we correctly reproduce the four-dimensional Higgs branch, and we're happy. Okay, so, the story becomes very rich with these unitarity bounds because you see here I was using very special properties of this very universal type of operators, but the moment I go to level three or to level four, I don't have that at my disposal. And then the game becomes a lot more intricate, but nevertheless, with uh, more work you can play it. And it leads to sort of very interesting conclusions, for example, one relatively easy thing to establish um, is a universal bound on C. By playing a similar unitarity game, you find that there's a universal bound on C alone. C to D is smaller or equal than minus 22 over 5. This translates into the statement that C for D is greater or equal than 11 30. And, uh, sorry, this assumes that there are no higher spin conserved currents. So you, you get a very cool result, you know, that the four-dimensional central charge in an interacting four-dimensional theory has to be bigger than this number. When you, ha you have this number, it means that the, the corresponding Virasoro algebra in 2D 
is precise the Virasor algebra of the Li Yang minimal model, which is the 2,5 minimal model. And so it's rather surprising you get to put a bound on the simplest interacting four dimensional superconformal field theory. But then you can get going and using a more elaborate reasoning, which again amounts to careful examination of these graded spaces and norms, etc. We haven't finished it, but we are pretty confident uh, about the following little uh, hope for theorem that the constraints of 4D unitarity and uh, plus additional bootstrap constraint that I don't have time to discuss. Using this, and if I, up to now, everything was completely universal, I had to make no additional assumptions about what further the uh, vertex superalgebra could contain apart from, apart from these universal subalgebras. But if I further assume that the, that the entire chiral algebra is just Virasoro, this is a strong assumption, of course. If I assume that the entire chiral algebra is just Virasoro at some central chart C, then I get to make stronger statements because level by level, I know that the entire state space must be made of Virasoro and then imposing orthogonality is rather stringent. And then you show that the only allowed values of C are the ones that correspond to the 2 comma 2M plus 1 Virasoro minimal models. Any other value will lead to a negative norm in four dimensions. Okay, so this is the beginning, hopefully, these baby steps into a classification program. So the, the main lesson here is that the kind of vertex operator algebra we get by this 4D to 2D map are very special. I illustrated in some examples that truly are very special. You know, you get very specific negative levels where you have a ton of null states which are needed to reproduce the four-dimensional geometry. Uh, and, um, and they're special really because if you are away from these uh, uh, very specific fine-tuned uh, levels, you uh, are in danger of violating the constraints of four-dimensional unitarity. So if one could really characterize and axiomatize the property, the additional properties VOA must have in order to descend from four dimension, you could perhaps hope that this is the beginning of a classification program of at least those VOAs. Now, the question of whether two different 4D theories must, could map to the same VOA is, of course, open, but there are no counterexamples at the moment. How am I doing with time? Uh, like zero minutes. Zero? No, how much time do you need? No, I. I I mean, the, the story is uh, open-ended. I can go on forever or stop now, but... Um, yeah, maybe okay, you can so, uh, um, summarize and, uh, sort of the big yeah, picture. So I, yeah. I, at least I gave you a glimpse of how um, uh, four-dimensional unitarity enters the story and how one can reconstruct the geometry of the four-dimensional theory from, uh, from this representation theory of the VOA. Um, let me, men let me mention um, one last thing. Um, so clearly the VOA has um, a lot to do with the Higgs branch, and, but it contains more information. And um, so this is a part of our ongoing effort is to try to characterize precisely which additional information apart from the Higgs branch you need to reconcile the VOA. That's one direction. And a simple first step in that direction is if I hand to you the VOA abstractly defined in terms of a set of generators and their singular OP coefficients, can you reconstruct the four-dimensional Higgs branch? This is a rather non-trivial question because the Higgs branch is there, but it's clearly somewhat hidden. The reason it's hidden is precisely this funny business of this R grading. The Higgs operators are these ones, but I, I, I hope I, I impress upon you that precisely 
extracting the leading term where the one that have h equal to r is in general non-trivial. If you had knowledge of this quantum number assignment, then you could do it instantly, but in general you don't have. And the Sugavara construction is already a, the, the simplest of infinitely many such ambiguities that can occur. And in, all, in many examples, in fact, in all examples that we bother to look at, there is a, a very interesting and very universal way to recover the Higgs branch. And I'm going to end with that. So it's still conjectural, but surely true. So, so given a VOA, there is a purely algebraic construction that uh, associate to it a variety. Uh, let's call it. That's VOA, let's call the VOA V, and let's call this XV. And I'm going to explain this in a minute, but the compelling conjecture that we have is that this is nothing but the Higgs branch. Okay, so how do we construct this variety? Um, so let's assume that the VOA is given by um, some set of generators. I gave example before, some finite set. Then um, we can consider polynomials in the formal variables as we, you know, we drop the z-dependence and we consider polynomials in formal variables, one variable for each generator. So example, in the case of Virasoro, we would just consider polynomial in a single variable t. Okay? And then we mod out by relations which are, in, which are obtained by the presence of null states. Let me give an example. Um, let's do the Virasoro minimal model at uh, of 2,5, then you will remember that this, uh, I don't remember the coefficient by heart, but there is a null state of this form in this theory. And L minus 2 squared is, just, is nothing by, but T squared in my way of defining this correspondence. But L minus 4 is twice the derivative of T. And the idea that I'm dropping the z-dependence really means I'm working modulo derivatives. So I actually want to throw away derivatives, which means that I should really set, I should really consider polynomials in T modded out by the relation that T squared is zero. Okay? That's, and you can generalize this game. You consider the nulls and you look at relations of this type induced by the fact that the null can contain uh, derivatives of the generators. And you set those to zero. Now, of course, this is not a geometric space because it's, it's just a fattened point. There's, it's just t squared is zero. And so the associative variety is then this space here further divided by nil potents. Okay, is the construction clear? I sketched here. So in this particular case, if I further divide by nil potents, I'm left with nothing. In other terms, the associative variety is a point, and that nicely, nicely agrees with the fact that the Higgs branch of this H0 theory is trivial, there's no Higgs branch. And you can keep going, check this story in all these examples, it always works, in this example and many more. But um, let me end with that uh, sentence, hopefully it will inspire some of you. The state, so I always universally have the stress tensor because it always comes from the R current. But if this conjecture is correct, 
you know, the stress tensor is clearly not a Higgs brand generator, it's the arc current. So it means, if this conjecture is correct, that there always must be a null state of the form nth power of the stress tensor is equal to a holomorphic derivative of something else, which means that in this quotient, the stress tensor must be nilpotent. And the existence of such an null state allows me to compute the torus partition function by inserting this null state and turning the statement that the insertion of this null state should equal to zero into a modular differential equation that should be obeyed by the torus partition function. And so we get the rather curious statement that the vacuum character of this chiral algebra must obey a modularly covariant differential equation. In fact, we have discovered that this is universally true. These are vector valued modular forms where the other solutions correspond to non-trivial modules of the VOA. And so this is very much still ongoing work. The physical interpretation of this modularity and this over additional representation, which presumably correspond to the insertion of surface defects in the transverse plane, is very much ongoing work. In fact, there was a paper today by Dedushensko and Fluder. I'll stop here. Excuse me.